especially on uh, the structure of macromolecules and proteins, both with respect to biogenesis, supercomplexes, and that's the title of his presentation, uh, or the topic of his presentation. Okay. okay, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I would also like to thank the organizers for this very wonderful opportunity to tell you a little bit about our work. And I'd like to echo uh, Miriam's words uh, in saying what a remarkable experience this conference has been the chance to interact not only with uh, fellow scientists and clinicians, but most especially with the patients and their families has made this a truly humbling and inspiring conference. So I, I think this is, this is uh, something I, I look forward to, um, hopefully being back again. All right, so the main area of interest in our lab is to look at structure function relationships within complexes of the mitochondrial inner membrane. Here we go within complexes of the mitochondrial inner membrane um, using a host of different kind of biochemical and biophysical uh, approaches, which I'm going to be telling you a little bit about today. So if we zoom into this morphologically complex organelle, we see that it is, of course, bound by a, a, an outer membrane and a very convoluted inner membrane that can be broken into cristae membranes and the inner boundary membranes that suppress uh, next to the, to the outer membrane. So if we zoom in and take sort of a simplistic look of the mitochondrial ultrastructure, we see how there, the proteins uh, in their complexes are really separated uh, spatiotemporally along with the lipid composition uh, of, the, of the different outer and inner membrane uh, domains. But what I want to focus on first, before looking at protein-lipid interactions and the implications that mitochondrial uh, remodeling has for them, I first want to zero in on just the simplified lipid bilayer itself and talk about the complexity of the biological membrane. For someone who's interested in membrane biophysics, this presents some very interesting conundrums. So if we look at a simple uh, biomembrane, even something that's composed of a single kind of phospholipid, we see that, uh, for example, neutron and x-ray um, uh, diffraction experiments have told us that on, uh, uh, in this thermally disordered bilayer, we get a very uh, disordered kind of composition of the, of the chemical groups, uh, a spatial distribution that varies due to the thermal thickness of the bilayer. So even if we have only a single kind of uh, lipid composition, we get this very thermally disordered kind of uh, uh, chemical environment. We can then go on and look at the emotional constraints that, that we can learn a lot from NMR, and we can see that there is a real uh, deviation in motional order as we go from the head group acyl chain junction uh, toward the center of the, of the nonpolar core, and we get this real gradation of segmental order parameter getting much more disordered toward the center of the bilayer. We also get these pressure profiles, these bilateral pressure profiles, where there's a high tensile strength at the head group lipid junction, and there are positive uh, pressures or repulsions at the head group region and within the nonpolar core. So this kind of biophysical property has big implications for things like conformational dynamics of, uh, say, the, the, the uh, potassium channel. Another kind of uh, 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 biophysical property would be uh, changes in the polarity as we go from the bulk liquid, lipid, uh, liquid uh, in toward the nonpolar core. We see this gradation of the, of the dielectric constant going from very high dielectric to a nonpolar uh, environment, which has important implications for things like electrostatic docking of peripheral proteins like cytochrome C. Okay, so this very brief introduction into the biophysical properties of, of lipid bilayers has real implications for someone who's interested in cardiolipin because it bears on all of these different properties. So apropos of this, uh, this uh, electrostatic environment, I just want to mention a study that we've done recently well, with cardiolipin, looking at the electrostatics uh, of, uh, and charge, uh, service charge density of, of, uh, of cardiolipin before getting into the main section of the talk. So if you look at the uh, electrostatic profile of a lipid bilayer, specifically one that's, that's a, an energy conserving membrane like the mitochondrial inner membrane, it is very complex indeed. So we have not only the transmembrane ion gradients that are contributing to what we would call the delta psi, but we also have this interesting dipole potential and surface potential. So it's a very complex electrostatic environment. Contributed, uh, the surface potential uh, contributed mostly by the, uh, by the uh, lipid head groups. So this brings us to cardiolipin and its charge contribution to the lipid bilayer. Okay, it of course, uh, we've, we've seen a lot of uh, schematics of cardiolipin during this conference. Tetraallyl cardiolipin will have these two phosphate groups uh, in, in the head group region, which when ionized will impart a charge of formal charge of negative two. Well, for a long time, the dogma has been that this head group is stabilized by a bicyclic ring, a, a, a resonance stabilized bicyclic ring structure that comes about through hydrogen bonding interaction with this hydroxyl group in the central glycerol. 
the implication of this is that these have two very disparate pKa values, one at about two where you'd find the first pKa value of phosphoric acid, and the other at about 8.5 uh, due to this resonance stabilization. So this means that at physiological pH, cardiolipin would be expected to exist as a monoanion. So whether it exists as a di or monoanion has very strong implications, not only for its surface charge density, but also for its protein -protein, uh, lipid-protein interactions. So we decided to use uh, uh, some biophysical techniques to look at, uh, to address this question. And we used not only uh, tetraldyl cardiolipin in a host of, of, uh, uh, of other uh, zwitterionic lipids, but also deoxycardiolipin, which lacks this central glycerol and would not be expected to mediate this kind of bicyclic structure and also monolysocardiolipin, which is, of course, relevant to uh, uh, an intermediate uh, in the remodeling uh, cycle and is, has relevance for Barth syndrome. So both of these variants would be expected not to have, based on the, the previously established model, would be expected not to have this kind of disparate pKa behavior. OK, so recently in the literature, uh, people have used uh, potentiometric titrations to question whether this model is really correct. We wanted to use a different kind of approach. So one of the approach we've used uh, was, is electrokinetic analysis. And quite simply, if we have a model membrane system like a liposome, where we've got a negative surface charge density shown in red, uh, we can model the, the potential energy function near the, uh, the in interfacial region because the cations, the, the uh, counterions in this case, will distribute in a Poisson-Boltzmann distribution, leading to an attenuation of the surface potential as we go out toward the bulk. So we measure the so-called zeta potential, which is a, a position away from the, the, from the liposome in this case, and we're able to use Goy chapman stern modeling approaches in order to ascertain what the surface charge density is. Okay, I'm not going to belabor this point because this is work that was published uh, for my group a couple of months ago, but uh, just point out that if we look at the zeta potential, which is, again, our, our index of, of uh, surface uh, charge density, we see that when we compare phosphatidylglycerol-containing liposomes shown in blue with those from tetralyl cardiolipin, we see a very different kind of profile, indicating that there is a larger charge uh, density from the TOCL in, under all pH conditions. Another way to look at this is if you consider that there are two disparate key pKa values, you would get what we would expect on the black trace right here, which is very different from what we obtain. So we conclude from this that under all pH conditions, cardiolipin is existing as a di anion. And we also further go on to look at the uh, deoxycardiolipin and monolysocardiolipin and see that they have the exact same profile. So from this work, uh, we, we concluded that cardiolipin, uh, the head group, behaves as a strong dibasic acid, that uh, it is existing as a dianion at neutral pH with both phosphates having the pKa values close to what you'd expect for phosphoric acid, and also that the ionization properties of both of these lipids, most importantly monolysocardiolipin, follow the same pattern. So this has a lot of implications for how we, this uh, informs our interpretation of defective uh, protein, pro, protein lipid interactions in monolysocardiolipin that I'll be talking about in a moment. Okay, now I want to get back to uh, the, the, the main point of what I wanted to tell you about today, and that is looking at lipid protein interactions or cardiolipin protein interactions and the implications that defective cardiolipin remodeling has for them. So in my lab, we sort of broken into two different uh, 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 categories. So we have uh, work uh, being done on the oxidation phosphorylation complex. Uh, and, uh, and, and uh, associated uh, individual complexes, and also that done on the protein import machinery. So of course, with the oxphos complexes, we are feeding in TCA cycle, uh, TCA cycle intermediates, for example, um, allowing electrons to flow thermodynamically downhill. We're pumping protons across into the inner membrane space, generating this electrochemical uh, uh, proton gradient that's used to drive a number of endergonic processes, like ATP synthesis. Okay, and then uh, we'll, I'll be getting back to that in just a moment. Um, but also, what I want to talk about first is uh, protein import, which was uh, uh, given uh, a brief introduction very nicely by Miriam a moment ago. Specifically, we're interested in looking at the TIM23 complex. Now, within the mitochondrial proteome, in the, in the human mitochondrial proteome, there are about 1,500 different proteins. Only 13 of those are actually encoded in mitochondrial DNA. The remainder are encoded in nuclear DNA, and they have to be post-translationally imported into the organelle. So if we zoom into uh, the uh, uh, higher resolution uh, cartoon of, of, the, uh, of this import machinery, we see that the TIM23 complex is a multi-subunit complex. A lot of our work deals with the TIM23, TIM50 uh, interactions. So if uh, the TIM23 comprises most of the protein translocating uh, ch ch channel, and the TIM50 uh, is, the, is the central receptor of this, of this uh, 
of this uh, machinery. So proteins that are synthesized in the cytosol are un uh, driven across the outer, outer membrane through the Tom complex in an unfolded manner. They'll then engage the TIM50 receptor, and then they'll be moved across the TIM23 channel in a, in a manner that requires the electric field. So if we look at the structure function relationships of, of this um, uh, system, we see that the TIM23 channel consists of four predicted transmembrane segments. And a lot of the work that we're, we do uh, is uh, biophysical-based work looking at the conformational dynamics that are coupled for instance, to the energy status of the, of the inner membrane. So this kind of electromechanical coupling, we're very interested in what, uh, what, what drives these structural changes, uh, and, and specifically how cardiolipin is important for allowing for these uh, kind of structural changes to occur. I'm not going to get into that story. That's, that's for a, a soon to be published uh, piece of work that will uh, be coming out with soon. Right now I want to talk about the TIM50 receptor and its interaction that we've discovered with the inner membrane that occurs in a cardiolipin dependent way. We discovered early on that TIM50 has a specific uh, uh, interaction sites with the TIM23 uh, channel, and that also its interaction with, uh, with this channel is, is very much dependent on the presence of cardiolipin. Um, so uh, the uh, early crystal structures uh, show that the core domain of TIM50 has this protruding beta hairpin, which if we look at an electrostatic map is, is highly basic. So this is going to be important in just a moment. Now, in order to inform our studies, we needed a structure of the entire receptor, which was not available, just this core was. Um, so we were able to generate, using small angle, uh, small angle electric scattering, an ab initio model of the TIM50. So this is the full length receptor with our homology model built in. So now we've got a good structural model for uh, analyzing the, the receptor interaction with cardiolipin containing membranes. Okay, so we started out using coarse grain molecular dynamic simulations to understand how this receptor might interact with membranes that contain cardiolipin. So you can see this is a coarse grain model uh, built uh, using a Martini force field. And what we're do quantifying here is just the self-association of this TIM50 receptor in solution with membranes by quantifying the distance to the membrane. And you can see by doing these coarse grain molecular dynamics that the interaction with the membrane uh, in the presence of cardiolipin shown above occurs very t with a very tenacious grip, um, whereas with POPC only, there's a very uh, a transient interaction that is not stabilized. You'll also note that this beta hairpin that's very basic is important for the interaction. That's modeled here in blue. So if we go from an atomistic to an all atoms model, we can see that this really does uh, have, a, have a strong interaction with cardiolipin containing membranes with the beta hairpin uh, shown right here. We can also, interestingly, model what kind of head groups are sort of at the footprint of this, of this uh, interaction, um, looking at the cardiolipin phosphates, which are shown in orange, relative to the TOC uh, 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 phosphatidylcholines that are shown in cyan. And we see that even though cardiolipin consists of only 20 mole percent here, they sort of gather preferentially underneath the footprint of this binding, which is, is similar to what we see with cytochrome C. And this has also allowed us to uh, model in what kind of side chains might be important for this, for this interaction with, uh, specifically with cardiolipin containing membranes. So this is leading us to generate some ideas about what kind of motifs might be important for interaction with uh, cardiolipin containing membranes. Okay, so this has allowed us to generate some ideas, some hypotheses to test empirically, and I'll just mention a couple here. So if we look at co-flotation or co-sedimentation, we see that in the presence of PC membranes only, there's a very little association uh, with, uh, with, with uh, the membrane of this receptor uh, domain. However, in the presence of phosphatidylcholine and 20% cardiolipin, we see a much stronger robust interaction, which is partially compensated by the presence of the monoanionic phosphatidylglycerol. Okay, so we can also use a, uh, a fluorescence-based approach where we put an environmental ref uh, reporter probe at the tip of that beta hairpin, and we see that in the presence of phosphatidylcholine only, there's very little uh, uh, interaction with the nonpolar core uh, indicated by the, the low spectral shift. However, in the presence of phosphatidylcholine, we get a much stronger interaction and sort of an intermediate one with phosphatidylglycerol. Uh, the point I want to make here is that uh, monolysocardiolipin does a very poor job of recruiting uh, TIM50 to the membrane. Okay, so I want to move on now and talk about another, oh, no, sorry. So uh, we also see the same kind of th uh, uh, effect as we titrate in the mole percent of cardiolipin, looking at the in uh, interaction of this peripheral protein with the, the membrane uh, has sort of a threshold effect with the steeply rising part of the interaction threshold being interestingly about where we see the physiological uh, uh, percentage of, of cardiolipin. Okay, now this brings uh, to mind another kind of peripheral associating, uh, cardiolipin uh, associating protein, which uh, uh, Dr. Kagan referred to uh, before, 
um, uh, cytochrome C. So this is sort of the quintessential archetypal peripheral membrane protein that interacts with cardiolipin-containing membranes. This is, of course, a redox protein. It's polybasic, shown by all the different blue uh, side chains. And it uh, has axial coordination of this heme group right here with a very important tryptophan, which has been used by biochemists for a very long time. So we all know that cytochrome C is important for the, uh, the redox transfer of electrons from uh, complex three to complex four. But pioneering work by, by, uh, by Dr. Kagan has also shown us that this interacts with cardiolipin-containing bilayers undergoing a structural change leading to this peroxidase activity um, that is a very important early step in apoptosis. So in regards to its interaction with cytochrome uh, cardiolipin-containing bilayers, we can show the, by looking at liposomes co-sedimentation and also SORI absorbance in the, in the, uh, in the uh, medium, as we titrate in the ionic strength, how the bound fraction changes, we lose the interaction of, of cytochrome C with the bilayer, or how the interaction uh, by the unbound fraction increases as we titrate in the ionic strength, indicating that this is really dominated by electrostatic interactions. However, with all of these different liposome components, I'll just point to, to the fact that within the sort of the intermediate uh, physiologically relevant salt range, Phosphatidylglycerol, shown in green, and monolysocardiolipin seem to do a, a little bit poorer job of holding on to the of cytochrome C as we titrate in the ionic strength. We can also use a FRET-based assay for look at the, looking at liposome binding, where we've got the heme group quenching the, the pyrene uh, head group fluorescence uh, of, of pyrene-labeled lipids. And we also see that there's a pretty good recruitment um, of, 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 uh, of uh, cytochrome to the membrane, regardless of the type of, of anionic phospholipid we've used including phosphatidylglycerol and monolysocardiolipin. Okay, so this means we're able to recruit the, the, uh, the protein to the membrane, but not necessarily induce a conformational change. So this is a very different phenomenon that can be monitored by shifts in the SORE absorbance or shifts in the tryptophan fluorescence. So as we titrate in the, the lipid protein ratio, we see that cardiolipin, and this is something that, that uh, has, been, has been documented before plenty of times, um, undergoes this structural change indicated by its uh, heme shift and also by its shift in trip fluorescence as the tryptophan undergoes a conformational change away from the quenching heme. We see that phosphatidylglycerol is not able to affect this kind of conformational change. And interestingly, monolysocardiolipin is all, also unable to affect this kind of conformational change. Now, this has been observed before in the literature. Um, but uh, we're, we're bringing it up at this point because it draws in, in interesting parallels with what we see with TIM50. Also interesting is the fact that this deoxycardiolipin shows a much a stronger, robust conformational change of cytochrome C. So we're following up on that. And this is, of course, linked to its ability to undergo peroxidase activity, which has been shown so elegantly um, through uh, Valerian's work. Another interesting way of looking at this is to see the depth of penetration of these, of these proteins into the nonpolar core. If we're talking about cardiolipin-containing bilayers, this will affect the same kind of, of uh, electric field, only this is allowing these proteins to delve deeply within the, in, in the nonpolar core of the bilayer, in effect, causing conformational changes. Now, exactly what's happening at this lipid bilayer might have something to do with the molecular geometry of cardiolipin, which, of course, is a hex 2 preferring lipid under many cases. It could be that this is in oops, could be that this is, in fact, inducing uh, some hex 2 propensity in this local region. The important thing is that we know that monolysocardiolipin has the same surface charge density, so the electrostatic docking is not likely to be a, a reason for, for this difference. Most likely, it's the monolysocardiolipin having a more cylindrical rather than a conical molecular geometry with only three acyl chains, a, a shorter splay of the lipid tails, and therefore it's unable to uh, affect these kinds of uh, HEX2 structures, um, perhaps brought about by partial neutralization through electrostatic interactions. Okay, the last thing I, uh, uh, which is demonstrated right here. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about is, uh, apropos of uh, lipid protein interaction with cardiolipin, is occurs with the respiratory chain. Okay, we, we've heard uh, many uh, interesting talks about how cardiolipin interacts with the respiratory oxbos complexes one through four, uh, assembling them into respire zones. So it's, so it's absolutely essential for the uh, assembly of the super complexes, which allows for much more solid state, uh, efficient solid state electron transport activity. What I want to focus in is complex four here. So we know that there are a number of specific sites where cardiolipin is specifically recruited. So this follows a study that uh, Miriam talked about uh, uh, going into this. It's something that we did in collaboration with Steve Claypool's group, where we used yeast as a model system. 
um, we created defects in the cardiolipin biosynthetic and remodeling pathway by creating knockouts in the CRD1 mutant, the CLD1 mutant, and the Tafazin mutant. And um, this is, of course, a, a nice model for, for Barth syndrome. Um, uh, given the beautiful introduction that Miriam gave, I won't uh, give, give any further indication into uh, the, the nature of these kinds of knockouts in yeast, but just remind you that the, in the Tafazin knockouts, we get overall reduced cardiolipin, abnormal cardiolipin acyl change, and this buildup of monolysocardiolipin. So it is a nice, uh, in this respect, a nice model for Barth syndrome. Okay, so after doing this kind of analysis, um, as, as uh, Miriam alluded, the lipid panel that comes from this is very much to be expected. In wild type, we get um, all of the expected lipids from uh, mitochondrial lipids. When we knock out the delta CRD, the cardiolipin synthase, we get no cardiolipin and a buildup of its immediate uh, uh, precursor phosphatidylglycerol. In the CLD, uh, in the CLD mutant, uh, something that is not able to undergo this lipase activity, we see uh, cardiolipin levels that are normal, but they have abnormal uh, acyl chain distributions. And um, uh, uh, in, in the delta TAS mutant, we also see this buildup of monolysocardiolipin and a general defect in cardiolipin. So it's a good model based on, on this lipid assay um, for looking at uh, uh, defects in the remodeling pathway. So if we look at the phenotype that results from this, we see that wild type uh, has, for example, normal supercomplex super uh, formation, judged by uh, uh, West, Westerns against AAC in this case. Delta CLD tended to phenocopy wild type, indicating that nascent, uh, uh, the, the, the nascent uh, cardiolipins that are made simply after the, the, uh, the synthesis reaction seem to do just as good of a job in, in, uh, in stabilizing supercomplexes. However, when we knock out uh, cardiolipin synthesis altogether or introduce the delta TAS mutation, that's when we start to see a real, real phenotypic effect. This can also be shown uh, in bioenergetics. If we look at membrane potential using the potentiometric probe TMRM, we see that after energizing the membranes we get and, and inducing uh, state three uh, uh, oxidase um, phosphorylation with these phosphorylation spikes after adding ATP, we see that uh, the return to state four respiration is quite rapid and efficient in wild type cells. Uh, in, in those from the delta CLD, we get the same kind of uh, efficient transfer uh, back to state four respiration, very much like wild type. However, with the delta CRD and delta TAS, where we've knocked out cardiolipin synthesis or wiped out the uh, transacylase activity, we get much uh, reduced, uh, uh, much uh, big defects in, this, in these uh, phosphorylation cycles. Okay, all this tells us that the, 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 uh, the, the uh, delta CLD, or the nascent uh, cardiolipin composition, seems to do just as good of a job as mature remodeled cardiolipin in supporting these bioenergetic functions. Okay, so we wanted to follow up on this by looking specifically at complex four. Now, complex four is, of course, um, a, a member of the heme copper uh, superoxide uh, uh, oxidase superfamily. Um, the structure of the of the uh, core subunits are shown right here. This will take electrons from cytochrome C, pass it down through a number of different redox centers, uh, consume four electrons for, to reduce uh, oxygen to water, and it will translocate four protons across the membrane to, uh, to uh, the uh, bio, um, to generate the electrochemical proton potential. Now, if you look at the cardiolipin interaction at the known uh, CL2 binding site, for instance, you see that we get a very uh, intricate network of polar uh, interactions with the, inter with, uh, with the residues of complex four at the certain subunits within the interfacial region. And then we get these, all of these dispersive contexts uh, that, that occur between the acyl chains and the irregular surfaces of the, of the transmembrane segments. So this is indicating what we, from, from the crystal structure that was first published in 2007. So this gives us an indication. Is, is the interaction of the polar head groups driving the interaction with these, with these respiratory complexes? Is it, is, what contribution is made from the acyl chains? So this is one thing we wanted to, to follow up on. Because we know that nascent cardiolipin seems to be doing just as good of a job at supporting uh, oxfos activity as, as wild type. So we first started reconstituting complex four into these nanodisks that we heard about this morning. And we saw that when we reconstitute them into these disks, um, supplementing them with cardiolipin or any variant thereof seemed to support activity just fine. We see the uh, purified uh, complex four, we see all the subunits right here. We've incorporated this into the nanodisks of different lipid compositions. And we see, uh, as judged by the uh, cytochrome C oxidation, in the presence of POPC only, we get very little activity, but when we add in cardiolipin at 20 mole percent, we get good activity. But what we really wanted to find out now is in a more native situation, what 
cardiolipins, what, what lipids are actually in the vicinity of complex four. Now to do that, we cannot go to this uh, nanodisc system because this requires a previous detergent solubilization and reconstitution. So we started to develop a technology where we can actually take membrane complexes directly from, from cellular tissue, reconstitute them into these nanoscale lipid bilayers in a way that does not delipidate the protein. There's no deter it completely obviates the role of any detergents. So we're able to use this styrene maleic acid polymer, which is shown right here, um, incubate it with isolated mitochondria to, in effect, punch out these lipoprotein complexes directly from cellular membranes into a soluble system that's bound by, these, uh, by this amphipathic belt of polymer. Now, this, uh, this work was done collaboration, initially in collaboration with the work of, of uh, Tony Watts at Oxford. At the time, back when this was first published, we were the first ones on the side of the Atlantic to be developing this technology. And we showed early on that we were able to reconstitute complex four. Uh, the the, uh, the nanoscale uh, bilayers are nice and monodispersed. We get complex four that has the same kind of spectral signatures that you'd expect. And we also get good activity. But the question is now, can we take this SMA uh, um, uh, extract, and can we purify complex four so that we can look specifically at the lipids that are in the vicinity of this complex? So we can, again, do an SMA extraction. So if we consider uh, these, uh, these, uh, this first extraction to lead to crude smouts, um, the smouts standing for SMA lipoprotein particles, I sort of consider this like taking a sheet of dough and then taking a cookie cutter and then cutting pieces of, of, uh, of the dough out. So, so some of them might contain just lipids, some of them might contain one complex or the other, but then you can further uh, chromatograph these and purify them if your complex is, uh, is affinity purified, purifiable, and then you, now you've got what complex four smell. So we've got this homogeneous population of complexes with their native lipid composition the, uh, around the annular lipids. Okay, so we know that these are pure, we know that they do not contain contaminating amounts of, uh, of, other, of proteins from other systems, and we can extract them from delta CRD, uh, delta CLD, or delta TAS, along with wild type. And we can ask some important questions. First of all, is there a preferential accumulation of certain cardiolipin species in the microenvironment of complex four? This is a great model system because we know cardiolipin specifically interacts with certain binding regions. So is there a preferential accumul accumulation of more saturated species or not? And we can also see if monolysocardiolipin, which we know to be the more toxic uh, version of cardiolipin, really uh, adding to its toxicity, do we see this avoided around complex four? Okay, so we've got this nice uh, system for doing that for using lipidomic analysis. So if we uh, just look at the crude uh, lipoprotein particles, we see that with wild type, we see phosphatidylcholine and the other amino phospholipids have the normal um, sort of distribution. In the delta CRD, we see a, a, there's no cardiolipin, but rather a buildup of phosphatidylglycerol. In the delta CLD, we get a very typical wild-type distribution, although we do get aberrant acyl chain composition, as I mentioned. And in the delta TAS, we get uh, the uh, buildup of lysocardiolipin. Okay, so this is for the crude extraction, so this is just non-discriminant. Now what happens when we look at the phospholipid composition right in the vicinity of complex four? Well, we, get, we see a number of interesting phenomena. First of all, we see a a slight increase in the amount of cardiolipin, but most compellingly, we see a big increase in the amount of phosphatidyl inositol and in the amount of phosphatidyl ethanolamine. So that was a big surprise to us. What we also were surprised about was the fact that lysocardiolipin, monolysocardiolipin was just as enriched around complex four as it was in the, in the general bulk lipid. Perhaps most interestingly, is looking at the acyl chain composition. So if we look at the total cardiolipin composition, just for the crude uh, extraction, shown in, in, in yellow here, we see in wild type we get a relatively homogeneous distribution, exactly like we've seen before, of these different cardiolipin species. In the delta CLD, we get a more um, a heterogeneous distribution, one that has a, a much more saturated species. And in the delta TAS, we get the same kind of uh, distribution we've seen before. The interesting point that I'll bring up is if you look at the complex four smelts, they have the exact same distribution as we got from the, from the, from the bulk uh, unfractionated smelts, indicating that there really doesn't seem to be a preferential accumulation of specific acyl chain compositions in these sites of specific interaction of complex four. Rather, it's just taking up whatever's in the bulk lipid. So my, uh, the, what we would take from this is that what's really driving the interaction is the, that, that is the head group interaction, that strong network of polar interactions that's really occurring, and it doesn't seem, at least by this analysis, to depend much on what the acyl chain composition is. 
Now, the next question is, are these functional? The, the answer is yes, they are. They all uh, seem to undergo comp complex three uh, oxidation in a manner that's sensitive to potassium cyanide. So, but, but this is one aspect of, of functionality. What we can also do is go on to say, well, they're able to undergo redox activity uh, the, irrespective of the cardiolipin composition. What other parameters can we measure in this soluble platform? So we can look at uh, ROS production, for example. Um, and I wish I could tell you the, the data for, for these other mutant species, but all we've got uh, right now is for wild types. So we know that we can measure ROS production over time during a, during a catalytic cycle. Um, so one thing we'd be interested in looking at is, although these, comp uh, these different cardiolipin compositions seem to support redox activity, maybe there's enough slip in the system with these different cardiolipins that, uh, that there is an increase in, in ROS production, for example. So these are the kind of questions that we can answer with this kind of system. Okay, so uh, just to wrap up, uh, we talked about the ionization properties of cardiolipin with the two low pKa values. Uh, we talked about the interaction of peripheral membrane proteins uh, and the important differences that monolysocardiolipin has relative to uh, cardiolipin, uh, wild type cardiolipin. And finally, the cardiolipin's interactions with oxphos complexes, showing, indicating that the unremodeled and remodeled cardiolipin seem to be functionally indistinguishable and that there doesn't seem to be a preferential accumulation in the vicinity of these oxphos complexes based solely on the acyl chain composition. Okay, with that, um, I would like to thank the people who uh, did the work on this. Uh, Caden Malhotra, uh, who did a lot of the work with TIM23, uh, uh, who is now doing a, P, uh, a postdoc with Mark Lemon at Yale. Uh, he uh, left the lab just, uh, just a few months ago. Uh, his work is being taken over by Ardab Modak. Um, everything else that you heard about today was being done by one of the most uh, talented PhD students I've had the pleasure of mentoring, and his, his name is Murugapan Sathapa, or Modi. Um, he is in the audience here, and he presented a poster last night. Um, so I'd like to really uh, give a shout out to him for doing a lot of this work. Um, the lipidomics was done by the lab of Jinlin Han at uh, Sanford Berman, and I'd like to acknowledge the work of Stephen Claypool, our collaborator on this work. Um, of course, I want to acknowledge NIH, NSF, and the American Heart Association, but most specifically, I uh, want to really acknowledge the Bar Syndrome Foundation, which has provided a lot of seed money for a lot of these projects that we've got that have some subsequently gone on and, and been funded by uh, federal agencies. And I'll thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Kagan. You know, this is a fascinating and like three talks in one. <laughs> very excellent. So, uh, as you understand, I kind of uh, what tortures me is still to understand why tetralinol L, L4, is preferred by cardiomyocytes. Of course, your yeast system because you don't have in linoleic acid in this yeast, yeast will never answer this particular right. question. But still you see that there is no preference for any particular type of uh, cardiolipin in the vicinity of complex and, and, form. And that's the point I want to make. This is done in a, I want to emphasize, this is in a yeast model system. This is not a cardiomyocyte. So in that respect, we're, we're, we're simply using this to answer a fundamental question. Does yeast complex four preferentially accumulate specific yes. species of cardiolipin? In the yeast model, it appears no. Mm -hmm. And insofar as complex four from yeast can be a good proxy for what we get in the human. No, what you show is very clear and very kind of persuasive. So, but the question still remains. So what is this so mysterious and unique in tetralinolyl cardiolipin that some cells, and it's not only cardiomyocytes, it's uh -huh. also liver. Yes. So in many tissues, in many cell types, tetralinolyl, if not remarkably kind of 80% uh, predominant uh, cardiolipin, but still a predominant species. Well, one so of the what, things... what can model simulation? Because what you show that the uh, uh, electrostatic interactions dominate, well, that's, I can only partially agree with this because there's, even with cytochrome C, there are signs of also hydrophobic interactions involved. Mm -hmm. But what is your opinion? That's what is good to know. Well, I think if, if one theme is to be taken from the talks in this meeting, it's that cardiolipin seems to be important during times of stress. So especially in the yeast system, if, if the cells are not stressed, they seem to be doing pretty okay in, these delta, in the delta TAS. So it could be that th these, are, these are all done under pretty happy conditions for the, for the mitochondria. So one of the excellent suggestions from my graduate student is maybe what we should do is pre-stress these cells and now see if there's a preferential accumulation 
of more, more um, unsaturated uh, cardiolipin in the vicinity of complex four. So, so I think uh, redox stress, temperature stress, something like that might be the key, and we're just not, we're, we're not observing it in this case. Michael? Um, I'm actually not that surprised that the molecular species composition uh, at the complex is not different. That's consistent with what Bill Darwin showed, mm -hmm. right? And we actually, in our last paper, also found the same thing. So, so this is in, in, in non-mammalian system, in a, in a mammalian system. So, but the question, the, the fact that you don't have any specificity, not only not in the acyl chains, but also not in the head groups, raises in our question that is, what is the phospholipid to protein ratio in these disks or these, these particles that you purify? Uh -huh. So we, we're still, I didn't want to bring out a number because these data are pretty brand new. Um, so we're still, we want to quantify the amount of protein that we've got as carefully as possible because this is a very important quantitation. But just to give you a ballpark estimate, if you look at the nanomoles of lipid, you know, based on the nanomoles of lipid per mega protein, if we're thinking about how many cardiolipins we're talking about in each disc, in each complex four containing disc, it's on the order of 10-ish. But we need to ten what ten individual ten. molecules of cardiolipin. Ten Mo molecules of cardiolipin. I see per complex per complex protein. In, in, right. in, yes. Right. So given the fact that there are three, maybe four specific binding sites for cardiolipin. Mm -hmm. I mean, what it suggests to a naive observer is that they are simply. I mean, you are simply having that much lipids around that protein that you're capturing, but you don't yes. see any specificity. I mean, you're not actually sampling the protein solvation shell, to use an old term, but you are sampling the membrane. Right, right. But, but, but if there were some preferential accumulation at, in those sites that, were, that right. were directly bound, you would expect to see some shift, um, some difference. And we just, we see absolutely no difference. Uh, could I just ask uh, maybe a clarification for my uh, lack of understanding? So I think what you and Valerian said is that uh, cardiolipin interaction with uh, cytochrome C is very important for apoptosis, and that the MLCL form doesn't really interact with cytochrome C, uh, we, but that's the predominant form in these BARF cells. So does that mean that the BARF cells should be resistant to apoptosis? Well, I, I think this is an incredibly, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very complex question, and here I am standing in front of the world expert on this very issue. This is, this is not something that uh, that, uh, that we have spent a lot of time doing. We're simply looking at protein-lipid interactions. But it would, it would suggest that the apoptotic program would be disturbed by a buildup of MLCL within the population of cardiolipin that's accessible to, to cytochrome C. I think that's all that we could say at this point. Would, would you agree with that, Valerian? I would agree and add to this that if you look at uh, you know, it's kind of uh, really from, as I was listening to you, I was asking this question too, because if uh, uh, tetraacylation or uh, triacylation is not that important, so why would it affect uh, in binding of uh, cytochrome C? So why would the whole cell and apoptotic uh, program care about it? It looks like it's irrelevant, but it's only partially so. Because the initial interaction is electrostatic. Yes. Subsequent yes. interaction. When the form complex is formed, so then the uh, ionic strength becomes less essential. Yes. Okay? And that's, that tells us that the hydrophobic interaction is essential as well. Yes. So for this reason, whether it's lysocardiolipin or oxidized cardiolipin does matter. And for this exactly reason, that conclusion may be exactly correct. And also, Lysa cardiolipin, in the end, uh, oxi oxidized cardiolipin do not bind that well as cardiolipins to cytochrome C. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. If there are no questions, there's a last question by Grant. So it, it, it looked like that in your, one of your Westerns that you'd shown, you did a double knockout as well, too, if you go back. They're oh, this is from the, yeah. the, the epistasis panel. Right, right. And, so and then did you take a look at those in terms of the, the extraction? Yes, and, and they phenocopied whatever knockout was, up, was, the, most, was the more upstream. It was, it was the, the, the rationale for that was to show that this was a, indeed an epistatic phenomenon. So 
that we're, we're looking at a single, a single pathway. So if you do a, a delta CRD and a delta CLD knockout, it phenocopies the delta CRD, for example. That, that was the rationale behind okay. doing those two yeast knockouts. And, and that was really, I, I need to say that that was all done by the Claypool group. Right, okay. But that was identical with respect to what you saw in terms of the, uh, uh, in terms of what you saw with um, the binding aspect. We never, we never did the double knockouts with the binding. We only did the single, the single okay. knockouts. Okay, all right, yeah. okay. Because I think it's worth doing the double. Not a bad idea. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Nathan.